Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar. We are sharing with you new data in the National Equity Atlas. I'm Sarah Truhaft, Director of Equitable Growth Initiatives at PolicyLink, and also joining us, as you can see on the video, are my colleagues at the USC Program for Environmental and Regional Equity. They're in Los Angeles, so I'd like them to introduce themselves. Justin and Pamela. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Scoggins. I'm the data manager at the USC Program for Environmental and Regional Equity and the primary architect behind the National Equity Atlas. Hi, I'm Pamela Stevens. I'm a data analyst here up here, and I support the team. Thank you. So we are trying something new today, um, which is this webinar with video, because we want to connect with you, the users of the National Equity Atlas. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today and what the National Equity Atlas is. Um, so PolicyLink, as you probably know, but in case you don't, is a National Research and Action Institute advancing economic and social equity. The National Equity Atlas is the product of a partnership, a deep partnership between PolicyLink and PEER, where Justin and Pamela are sitting. And we built the National Equity Atlas as a tool um, to help advocates, policymakers, practitioners, people working for change in their communities to track, measure, and make the case for inclusive growth. So this comes out of our project um, to equip people with a narrative around why equity matters so much as our nations and communities, demographics are changing, people of color are becoming the majority, it makes advancing equity and inclusion all the more important for everyone, those most left behind and the strength of our economy as a whole. So we built the Equity Atlas as a tool. Today what we're, and it's a living resource, and so today we're sharing new data that we've added that break down the data more by detailed racial and ethnic subgroups, which we group together by, by ancestry, by self and self-reported ancestry. So we want to share that data with you and we're using video to connect better. Right now I'm going to take you to the site and share my screen. You won't see us anymore for the next 20 minutes or so and I'm going to take you through the site that give you a little, a little intro to the National Equity Atlas and then share the new data and indicators. Um, and then we'll come back and have about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end and we'll be on screen again so you can connect with us. And I have three asks for you today during this webinar, which is one, could you please not go to the Equity Atlas as we're doing the demo because that could slow down the demo. Um, so please don't go there while you're online now and go there after. Um, two, please type in your questions into the chat box. Justin and Pamela are going to be tracking the questions as I go through the demo and we'll get to them after the demo. And then three, we will have a short survey for you after the webinar. And if you could please fill that out and give us some feedback on this format, if you like it, um, what we could do next time because we're going to plan to do these every month. So with that, and I would also say that we have another partner here, Jen Gaynor, who is behind the scenes, and she can help answer logistics questions, which you can ask through the, through the chat box as well. Um, so now I am going to go to the Atlas, and we'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs> All right, so here we are at the National Equity Atlas, the homepage. This gives you a sense of what the atlas is. Our messaging behind the atlas um, is around the changing face of America, how demographics are shifting, how the inequities that persist across racial and equity racial and ethnic groups, as well as by income, are a threat to our prosperity. And what we say is equity is the superior growth model, that by addressing those inequities, we are all stronger. So we have some unique data in the atlas. This is giving you one, one data bite, which is that if we closed racial and ethnic gaps in income, we would have $2.1 trillion more in our economy. And we have that data point for all of the the geographies that are in the atlas, which I wanted to share with you, with you, which are the largest 150 metropolitan regions, 
all 50 states, the largest 100 cities, and the United States as a whole. So what the Equity Atlas does is it provides you with indicators of changing demographics, equity, and the economic benefits of equity for all of those geographies. And what we really focused on is disaggregating the data by race, ethnicity, income, um, as much as we can. We really want to provide you with that disaggregated data and then showing you change over time, allowing you could to compare regions with each other, places with each other, and um, being able to download the charts and use them um, in your advocacy and your policy making. So I'm going to go to the indicators section of the site to give you a sense of what that is and what you'll find with every indicator. We really focused on making the site easy to use for people who are not crunching numbers and doing data analysis all day long, right? People are busy making change happen. So here is our first indicator, race, ethnicity. For every indicator, you can look, get a definition of the indicator at this question mark, get a short definition. You could go and look at more detailed technical documentation. You get a chart or a map or a graphic for every indicator. Here we're looking at changing demographics. And the gray is the non-Hispanic white population, and you see it over time, how demographics are changing, and the communities of color, black, Latino, Native American, Asian, and Pacific Islander are growing over time. And we have projections going forward to 2040 for this indicator. So underneath each indicator, you will find a download button, a share button so you can use the data to have conversations, and then you get an interpretation of the indicator, and then a statement about why it matters for equitable growth. So with the demographic indicators, it's about the importance of equity and inclusion as those populations grow. And then you also get strategies. So this is about data for action and data for change. We want to equip you with those strategies, and we share different strategies for every indicator. For every indicator, you will get an example of how a community organization on the ground is making change happen, and then you'll get additional information about um, new other data sources and other sources about the strategies. So our indicators are broken down into three categories. So changing demographics, you'll find the indicators here under changing demographics. And then equity indicators are broken into three buckets, which you see here, economic vitality, readiness, and connectedness. So by economic vitality, we're looking at can everybody participate in the regional economy? So here you see indicators of employment, wages, income, home ownership. Under readiness, these are indicators of the workforce and the readiness of the human capital in the region to be the workforce of the future. So you see health indicators here, indicators of environmental health, indicators of education and youth disconnectedness, and we're going to go into those more. And then connectedness indicators, can people connect to the regions um, or the community's assets and resources? And then the third category of our indicators are the economic benefits of equity. And this is where you can get the data on the potential gains to the overall economy, the gross domestic product, or GDP, with racial equity. And you can get that for regions, states, and the US as a whole. So let's go into the new data that we've added. Um, over the past two months, we've added data broken down by, by subgroups, racial ethnic subgroups. And we did that because We've always wanted to do that for the Atlas since we launched in October of 2014, and we needed to figure out how to do that um, and how to provide that data to you all, and we've figured out that methodology. Um, so we've added it to the demographic indicators, the detailed race ethnicity. And so I'm going to show that to you now. And again, please don't go on the site while I'm doing this just so that we can get through it. Um, but here is how we added the, the data by ancestry. So here you're seeing um, the detailed race, race ethnicity indicator. And underneath it, 
First, you have the binativity, which is the chart that you're seeing now, the pie chart. And then you can go to by ancestry. And so for the United States, this is going to give you a picture of um, by ancestry, how those broad racial ethnic groups break down in absolute population numbers. So we're looking at now underneath the, the chart the Asian and Pacific Islander population as a whole, and it breaks it down into um, more detailed subgroups based on how people reported their ancestry um, in the census. And the data here is the five-year data, 2008 to 2012, from the American Community Survey. And so you're seeing here the largest group is East Asian. We grouped together all of these detailed ancestry groups. And the reason why we do that is because in smaller regions where there's not enough data to provide the detailed ancestry groups, you'll still be able to see at least the broader categories of groups. And so we provide this data for every broad racial ethnic group. So as you see here under race ethnicity, your choices, you get it for the black population, pulling it up here, most people when they identify their race as black under their ancestry, they say African American, that's the large majority here, so that's why you see this large bar. Um, we did it for the Latino population, which I'm pulling up. So here, you know, clearly in the United States, you're seeing the largest number of Latinos are of Mexican ancestry, but you can break it down by all the groups. Native American, and then also the white population. So this is showing you the detailed racial ethnic breakdowns by ancestry. So that's pure demographics. What's really interesting and what we just released this week on Monday is the detailed racial ethnic breakdowns for equity indicators. So we added it for six equity indicators. I'm going to point them out now and you can get those in the um, blog post, which I'll direct you to. But we added them for median wages, for $15 an hour, for unemployment, and for home ownership here. And then we added them under readiness to disconnected youth and education levels. Um, and we chose those indicators because they seemed to be the priority indicators. Um, and we will try to add those de these detailed racial ethnic breakdowns by subgroup um, as much as we can going forward. But let me take you to the disconnected youth indicator to show you this. So here is the data on disconnected youth, which is measuring 16 to 24 year olds who are not working and not in school. And so that is a population, it's often called opportunity youth because it is a, a population that is ready um, for interventions, strategies, policies to link them to education, school, put them, make them ready for um, their future to realize their full potential. And so when you, underneath the chart here, you can find the by ancestry, and that's where you'll find the detailed groups. So I'm going to click on by ancestry to show you the new data. And it is broken down just like the, the previous indicator I showed you. It's broken down um, by the five broad racial ethnic categories here. And so what do we see here? So first we see, I'm going to take you back for a minute to the overall breakdowns. So you can see overall we see that Asian and Pacific Islanders have the lowest rates of youth disconnectedness, right? So you see here 8% of youth in the Asian or Pacific Islander community as a whole are disconnected. It looks like that community is doing the best out of all the racial ethnic groups, right? Um, and when you go to the ancestry category, here you see again the rate for all Asian and Pacific Islanders of 8%.
but as you scroll down, you see that actually there's a lot of variation within this group. So among Bengali youth, 13% are disconnected. Burmese youth, 16%. Cambodian, 17%, right? So that 8% is really masking a lot of um, particular populations that are facing this challenge of disconnectedness. As you scroll down more, you really see the challenges with the Pacific Islander population. So 20% of all Pacific Islander youth are disconnected, one in five. Um, and then you can see the breakdowns for Samoan, Romanian, and other Pacific Islanders. Whenever you see the other group, it's people who um, did not indicate one of these large groups, um, larger groups on the census form. And so we still want to provide that information, so that's why we create those categories. So this is for the United States as a whole, and you can pull it up for your region. Let's go to Los Angeles. So, you, so for every indicator, you just start typing in the state, region, or city name, and it should come up, and then you click Explore. So here we are in Los Angeles. We're still looking at the Asian or Pacific Islander population, and you can see it 7% of all Asian or Pacific Islanders disconnected compared to the 8% nationally. And here in, in Los Angeles, Cambodian youth stand out. Um, and you also see here how some of the categories get collapsed. Um, we basically, our threshold is that we need to have 100 survey observations to provide that. And so you see some collapsed categories. The Pacific Islander youth in Los Angeles are doing a bit better than nationally here, 12% compared to the 20%. Um, I'm going to take you to another region here on this indicator to show you something. So let's go to Las Vegas. And here you see some of the categories drop off um, because there's fewer um, in them, but we're still able to provide more subgroups than previously, much many more. Um, so here in Las Vegas, higher rates of disconnectedness among the Asian or Pacific Islander population overall, and then higher rates among Filipinos specifically and Southeast Asian um, people Etc. So this shows you what you can um, what you can access in this indicator. I'm going to go to another indicator, which is education levels. So here is where oftentimes the headline finding you'll even see this coming out of institutions like the U.S. Census. Asian and Pacific Islanders are doing better. The Asian community is doing you know much better and much more educated. As you all know, um, I'm sure you know that is. Uh, it perpetuates a myth of the model minority, um, and it really is important to break it down by subgroup because our immigration policy has favored more highly educated people who are immigrating here um, from Asia, and so that there are actually a lot of people who are not as educated who need interventions. So let's go down to a region. Let's go to a different region. Let's go to Philadelphia. All right, so here you see overall in terms of education levels, the Asian and Pacific Islander populations, especially U.S. born, are doing better than the other groups. Let's break it down by ancestry. All right, and so here you see 61%, you're looking at the education levels, who has an associate's degree or above, that's the default, and you can find that here, AA degree or higher, and you see 61% of all Asian or Pacific Islanders, but among the Vietnamese population, just 27%, among the Cambodian population, 14%, one thing you can see in the atlas is you can compare a region with a city. And so take note of the Chinese population here in Philadelphia. 57% have an AA degree or above. Now let's go to 
the city of Philadelphia, and here you see the Chinese population in the city of Philadelphia, 32% have an AA degree or above. So that is a way, the, making these comparisons, looking at the city and the region, the region compared to the United States, helps you understand what your potential um, opportunities are in a given place for interventions, um, strategies, and policies that help lift up people and help them reach their full potential. So that is a very short preview of the new indicators. I want to show you where a couple of our analyses are of these indicators so you can dig in a little bit more. And then I'm going to turn back on the camera and we will go to the q and A. I I hope you've been asking questions. So here you can see a post about youth disconnectedness and a post about educational attainment. This post here gives you a broad overview of the indicators that we've added. Um, so I hope that you've been asking your questions. I'm going to now turn on the webcam. Hello. <laughs> All right, great. So, Justin and Pamela, have you been fielding all the questions in the chat box? I think you might be on mute. Thank you for that. Now you can hear me. Um, yes. A few questions came in. We still have the uh, question box open in case there are more. Feel free to ask. Um, the first one was about uh, how uh, mixed races are captured, and I wonder if, uh, I guess I'll, I'll take a, a shot at that. Um, so uh, in the broader uh, definitions of race, ethnicity that appear for uh, nearly all of the Atlas indicators, um, there's a category that includes people of mixed race as well as those who report uh, some other race that's not one of the, the first five, um, white, black, Latino, Asian, or Pacific Islander. Um, uh, or Native American. Um, and so in this, in the subgroup, the new details, uh, ancestral breakdowns, um, we did not include uh, the mixed race, uh, broad racial ethnic group in the breakdowns, uh, mainly because uh, we weren't quite uh, sure how to approach it. It seems that a, a maybe a better, a more interesting way to uh, disaggregate that population would be um, by the different, different races that um, they identify with rather than ancestry. Um, I think that, you know, given it's a, a really rapidly growing and young population, um, I think we may need to uh, prioritize figuring that out in the future. Um, another question, there, there were a couple other questions about, um, well, one in particular about uh, Native Americans and the subgroups. I think it related to the disconnected youth indicator. Um, and the question was basically uh, about the fact that the, there are the schools that Native Americans attend, maybe part of uh, sovereign nations, and uh, they were wondering if uh, those are captured in the data. Um, so with that respect to that particular indicator, and uh, they are, they should be. I mean, the census, the American Community Survey is, is administered in sovereign nations, and it's uh, sort of that the definition of being enrolled in school is self-reported. So if someone goes to um, their local school, uh, then they'll report being in school. So they should be captured as well. To give you a short break, Justin, maybe I can answer the question about people of color, which is a great question. We get it a lot. Um, so how do we define people of color in the National Equity Atlas? So that group is everybody who identifies as everyone other than non-Hispanic white. So as you know, the census asks two questions, um, or as you might know um, or not, the census asks two questions. Um, one is what is your ethnicity and one is what is your race. And the ethnicity question is you know, Latino or non-Latino, Latino and Hispanic. And so 
there's that question and then your race. And so when we say people of color, it's everybody who is not, uh, not Hispanic and not white. Great. Um, okay, and there's another about, I see maybe three other questions that relate to the data source and uh, reliability of the estimates. Um, I think uh, I can kind of combine all those into one response. Um, so uh, most, I think all of the data that we just reviewed um, is based on the public uh, microdata samples, public use microdata samples uh, from the American Community Survey. So these are like the individual responses to the American Community Survey, which is often summarized to geographies such as census tracts, counties. Um, and uh, so it is, is a pretty fairly large sample. It's, it's the largest uh, survey that we could use to do this sort of, provide this, this sort of data. It uh, covers 1% of the U.S. population each year. And all these estimates kind of uh, pool five years of that together. So it's a 5% sample of the U.S. population. It is certainly not, um, I mean, I think the census does their best to make it as representative as possible. Um, it's still not perfect. Um, and there are certainly, uh, you know, particularly groups of color, uh, uh, groups uh, that don't speak English uh, are, tend to be underrepresented. And I think they're always trying to correct for that. However, it's still not going to be perfectly representative, uh, but at the same time, it's the best uh, data we have. Um, and regarding, there was a question about confidence intervals, uh, in particular uh, with respect to, I think, uh, you know, Native Americans in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, the, so the response to that is uh, similar. Um, it is possible to calculate confidence, confidence intervals using the public use microdata sample. There's a formula for it. However, the amount of data that we're uh, processing and analyzing, it would, uh, it's, it, it's, not, it's not really feasible uh, for us at the moment to calculate confidence intervals for every single estimate that's reported on the atlas because there are uh, probably, I don't know exactly how many point estimates there are, but there are definitely thousands. Um, so I. I think that so what we do to sort of uh, as a shortcut to avoid reporting uh, very erroneous or misleading data is to require that there are at least 100 uh, raw survey responses behind any estimate reported. So, um, and this is, uh, for example, the percent disconnected youth um, is the share of the youth ages 16 to 24 who are neither working or in school. So in that case, for each subgroup estimate where we report a percent uh, of disconnection, uh, we would require at least 100 um, people that, of that particular racial ethnic uh, subgroup um, that are between ages 16 and 24. Um, so we feel that that you know, does provide a, a reasonable safeguard against uh, reporting unreliable estimates. And that is the reason why um, when you uh, go to particular regions, there are not uh, a lot of the data for subgroups that may exist in those regions is not reported. So it looks like we are almost at time. Um, thank you for your questions. I think that there are questions that we, we, there's not too, too many, so we could follow up on them after this webinar, so we will do that. Um, one quick last question is on that I think is very interesting. Do Middle Easterners and Slavic communities that have people of color experiences not get counted as people of color in this data? If you could sort of quickly within a minute, Justin. Sure. So I think that that is, uh, I mean, that's part of the reason. I don't know if any of you have uh, read some of the equity profiles that we've done uh, over the past few years. Um, but in Detroit in particular, there's a large Middle Eastern population um, and this question comes up. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of data that's disaggregated by race um, necessarily must rely on the census's definition, and it's often in this broad form of, uh, you know, non-Hispanic white, uh, non-Hispanic black, Hispanic or Latino, non-Hispanic Asian or Pacific Islander, uh, non-Hispanic Native American, and non-Hispanic mixed or others. There's six broad categories. And so we know that, uh, um, therefore, you know, that most Middle Easterners uh, identify, answer that question, uh, identify as non-Hispanic white. So they are included in that category for 
uh, indicators that break the data down in those broad six racial ethnic groups. Um, but this is part of the reason why we uh, produce the subgroup data. You can find um, these particular subgroups that may sort of feel, uh, have the experience of people of color in America, but are classified as non-Hispanic white. If you go to the indicators and go to the, the uh, white uh, kind of filter to the white population and look at the subgroups, you'll see uh, a lot of these groups represented there. Thank you so much. Um, I know that there's more questions, but we want to respect your time and also please um, complete our survey. Let us know what you think about this format um, because we're trying to experiment with providing you with the, most, the best information that we can to explain the data and help you use it. So thank you so much and hopefully we will see you again next month. Bye everybody.